it's an honor for someone from the University of the Western Cape to appear to ASA and our university's motto, Respice Prospice. We're thrilled to see you've adopted for this symposium, looking back, looking forward, hindsight, foresight. The time only permits a few sound bites from the paper that I presented. We are the first generation of humans in 200,000 years in Africa of whom the majority will never see the Milky Way in their lives because over half of Africans now live in light polluted towns and urban areas. So we need to make a very conscious effort to recall that the biggest way of popularizing astronomy for many generations was the big planetarium above the night sky itself, the biggest screen of all. Astronomy appears to go back further than most people thought in Africa. From 35,000 years before the common era in what is today Swaziland, the Lobombo bone has got niches carved to mark a lunar month, 29 days over there. Even more astoundingly, the Ishanga bone from today's Democratic Republic of Congo in 20,000 BC has got chipped in this one of its sides a series of prime numbers, 7, 11, 13, 17. We all say as a cliché that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But we don't think that it's purely the fluke that copies of copies survive that we know of the achievements of ancient Greek and Egyptians in geometry and trigonometry. And this statistically highly improbable event that this bone was coated by ash before scavengers, termites and bacteria wiped it out lets us know about this. It poses the question how many other prehistoric mathematicians were thinking of prime numbers between today's Congo to Mali of which we don't know. The ancient Egyptian astronomy is well known for all those beautiful coffee table books that we have today. And looking at Manasseh, there is one painting argued to be of a comet and several others. It seems that Africa can take pride in having the oldest known astronomical observatory in stone. This is about 2,000 years older than the beginning of the stone construction at the most famous publicized Stonehenge in the United Kingdom. Close-up view of one of it. It is on the border of Egypt and Sudan. Then, if we look at the first coins produced in Africa from 300 of the common era, I should here mention that the sign of the crescent and the star is pre-Islamic and in fact pre-Christian. It goes back a long, long way in many cultures. When the kingdom of Aksum in today's northern Ethiopia, Eritrea, when the royal family was converted to Christianity in 333 CE, the sign on the coins was immediately changed to the Christian cross and this is in fact the first use of the Christian symbol on coins anywhere in the world. So we can date these coins at earlier in 333 of the common era. Looking at other ways that astronomy was popularized in pre-Islamic North Africa <clears throat> from today's Libya to the Canary Islands. It was Amazigh, the people others called Berber, and they had <clears throat> a lunar calendar of which fortunately some examples were preserved as K 
cave rock paintings on the Canary Islands, and there's a whole doctorate going into great detail uh, analysing of what they uh, produce. And you've again got in coffee table books examples of medieval Timbuktu manuscripts showing that the Ptolemaic system of the time was also taught south of the Sahara as well as north of the Sahara. Time means that we now got to fast forward a little bit and I want to look at our Department of Arts and Culture, Science and Technology, as it was called in 1996. It said something very interesting. It is also important to maintain a basic competence in flagship sciences such as physics and astronomy for cultural reasons. Not to offer them will be to take a negative view of our future. The view that we are a second class nation chained forever to only the treadmill of feeding and clothing ourselves. Now, how was astronomy and space communicated to the public in the more recent eras? Well, if you go back to the battle days of apartheid, Southern was open to the public only one night per year, and if you left that too late, you had to wait 16 months for the next chance, as I found out the hard way in those years over there. Then the South African Museum got its first planetarium also back in the 1960s. It was a bell-shaped tent and it seated roughly 16 or so uh, persons. The operator confided to me after 1990 that while all planetariums in the world switch off the lights during performances, this one also kept the lights they switched off between shows. And the reason was to prevent white racists seeing that they were allowing colours to sit in it and demanding it be made whites only. Because remember, the SA Museum was a national government-owned facility, not the Cape Town City Council. Now, once democracy came, Sutherland is open, like in all the other democracies, around the year for visitors, and SARES created its first full-time post for public educators, and we've been very privileged to have charismatic entertainers, such as Case Race Day, who's with us today, and Kevin Govinda, who is really carrying on sterling efforts on all this. And of course, he organized, when we had the International Year of Astronomy, they printed for some reasons on the back of the shirt, so I'm deliberately wearing it back to front so everybody can see it. We had our first big star party as the United States uh, amateur astronomers have so done. When I left high school and was thrilled to get to UCT as a student in the 1960s, I got quite a big shock that at all the student socials I went to, uh, when you mixed with women students, the first question I asked you was not, hi, I'm saying so, what's your name? It was, hello, I said, what's your sign? <laughs> <laughs> turned out they meant astrological sign. And for a decade, people always asked me, when to your birthday? And I soon learned not to naively think this meant they wanted to know what day do I give you a birthday gift. They wanted to fit you into the astrological race or astrological categories that your birthday would reveal. And I was puzzled, why was this so? In the 1960s, very few women had the privilege of access to university, less than one-fifth of university students at the time. So why was a superstition found even among the most highly educated women of that era? And what I discovered was that magazine proprietors and editors fingered women as soft targets for Eurocentric astrology. Every single women's magazine in the country, owned by male editors and on, uh, proprietors, had astrology columns, indoctrinating women in astrology, all the time, every week of the year. When the first generation of black middle class 
accelerated after 1990. Immediately the CNA was flooded with a whole batch of new magazine titles focused on um, black yuppies rising up. And everyone and the black woman again had those astrology columns indoctrinating relentlessly there. So we do need to be aware of this. Now, in astronomy tourism, the headlines always go to the seven billionaires who have been to the space station, including our own Mark Shuttleworth and the suborbital hops planned by Virgin Galactic will, of course, get future headlines. But I want to emphasize that when we think about it, 99% of space tourism, of astronomy tourism, is on the ground. There's over 10,000 tourists a year to Sayers facilities, including uh, Sutherland. The Sutherland Hotel, struggling to survive as many hotels and equivalent rural boats, has now been open. Several bed and breakfast places also open. But what is interesting is that far more wider than the five or six BMBs that open in Sutherland to supplement the hotel in catering for the tourists going to the uh, observatory, the property prices across the board rose remarkably in Sutherland compared to other rural towns of the same population. In short, it was seen among the income bracket of couples who can afford to buy a second holiday home as a trendy place to be. This is where the high-tech stuff is going on. It's a hip place to be. So they were buying a property far more widespread than just the five or six BMWs. And we've seen the same thing now starting to happen in Calvinia. One of the newspapers reported that whereas the deserted houses could be bought for 40,000 rand uh, two or three years ago, it's now a million rand a house. So the SKA is having this extraordinary impact on uh, the property market over there. And I'd like to argue that the Overberg test range and hotel should also be opened up for daily space tours by the general public and not limited to a few privileged persons coming in, such as ourselves from one or other institution. When I was at the Cape Canaveral Visitor Centre. I was a Fulbright Scholar in residence for eight months, so this gave me a chance of a lifetime, which I used. I counted 12 ticket kiosks and 20 buses parked outside the Cape Canaveral Visitor Centre. So that's the scale that our uh, space-related facilities ought to be popularising, uh, using every opportunity and resource to popularize among South Africans as a whole. And we've already got our first astronomy tourism dedicated company, and we're honored that Ketchel is in the audience with us uh, today, and they're helping in the national parks at uh, busy popularizing astronomy. I'd like to quickly end <coughs> with a few policy recommendations for us to lobby for when we leave this exciting symposium and go back <coughs> throughout the country. The first is that the Czech Republic in 2002 and Slovenia 2007 were the first to have at the national level a dark sky law. And we need to lobby that whether using the National Building Regulations, whether using the Astronomy Geographic Advantage Act, it now be made a crime to sell any external outdoor light fixtures that are not full cut off throughout the country and that a condition of getting any building plans to pass, a condition of buying and selling any property is that it is updated in that way. Of course, when we're talking to those who don't share our passion for astronomy, our lobbying will focus on that in addition to LEDs, uh, full cut of light fixtures mean you, you lose a smaller wattage bulb and thus you're saving electricity and money. And for many middle class people whose electricity bill is now over a thousand rand per month, this is a persuasive point. For city council squeeze, if you can cut down your lighting bill at night, that's also a useful point. The next argument I'd like as all to make 
is that, of course, to the professionals in those fields, astronomy is a science discipline. Astronautics, like aeronautics, is an engineering discipline. But I want to argue that they're natural allies <coughs> who can help each other <coughs> and support each other in many ways. If we go back to 1912, when ASA was founded, there was no convergence between astronomers and rocketeers. But in 2012, with the digital revolution, software, computers, just go through the instrumentation workshop, sensors, the motherboards, those extraordinary overlaps between them. But above all, it's in public outreach that is most helpful to bulk together for synergies, astronomy, the other space sciences, and astronautics. When I've done volunteer duty on open nights at the McLean, inevitably the questions include something about the latest space probe or any other space spectacular on the way. Similarly, I've been told by our National Space Agency persons that wherever they go, the first question they get asked is SKA. Now, instead of being irritated by this, see this as a very entrance way to making people excited about astronomy, <clears throat> its sister space sciences, and astronautics over there. <clears throat> now, the amateurs who are here today and their friends have done splendid work <coughs> in volunteering outside their paid jobs to do what they can to bring astronomy to school children and to the public. <coughs> but we need to lobby for things that are beyond the resources of amateurs. The SAIR tours to Sutherland are in effect limited to the middle class who have cars, who can afford to pay overnight accommodation, and the petrol to and fro. Our billionaire, Mark Shuttleworth, pioneered a mobile s and show with a big astronomy astronautics component which toured 100 schools in nine provinces out of his own pocket. And what we need to lobby our government and provincial governments to do is that for each province should set up a mobile s and show on trailers, uh, unlike the fixed one we have in Ma Mowbray Main Road, the Science Centre, and that it should tour that province with at least three edutainers speaking the three most widespread languages of that province. Here it would obviously be Afrikaans, Kaza, English, and other languages in the other provinces. And we must urge our Department of International Relations to lobby with the African Union's African Ministerial Conference on Science and Technology to help seek donors for less well of other African countries to start up the same uh, procedure. And indeed, uh, there was a recent conference by the HSRC and other sponsors looking at how we can popularize astronomy and a cooperation across the disciplines. And literature is one way that from science fiction, satire, to tragedy, one can use to popularize astronomy. Uh, just in the two quick examples of that. True Confessions, who really gave Nick Copernicus the idea that Ptolemy and the church got it all wrong. One moonful night, Mrs. Copernicus whispered, Darling, the earth moved. <laughs> and the last poem is an elegy called Shuttle. <clears throat> These are the laws of physics as immutable as those of the Medes and Persians. You, frailness of flesh and skin, wrapped in only blueprints and hope,
to plunge through furnace of plasma, burning, blasted, luminous beyond Mach Melton, torn molecules, pink and purple, cremating you and setting to the sky. If all goes well, you shall fly as a butterfly bolted to a bullet. If not, your only grave shall be Schlieren lines across a shocked sky. To strangers, your death shall be as beautiful as fireworks. But to those who knew you, grief. They vanished, became sky, a rain of metal tears upon the land. Writhing, that contrail became a cenotaph, a wreath we laid on our voyage to worlds. website, there are various things there. So you must just not be shy about speaking up. Uh, you probably only got time to give one example. The <clears throat> Cape Arc has published an astrological horoscope prediction for a Cape Town athlete. Three days later he died. I pointed out, wrote a letter to the Cape Argus, that if a horoscope cannot predict only three days ahead, the most important fact in a human's life. Uh, this is the most devastatingly strong evidence that astrology is a fraud. Well, they published a letter, they privately sent me emails congratulating me and saying how wonderful this was, which I've never had in our century of writing letters to the editor. But they continue to run astrology columns. The office is here as pushing, uh, expanding readership when you're competing against the internet and valuable for profits. Just do the best we can. Yeah. Could there not be programs to actually actively put more astronomy in, in the mm -hmm. media? Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think every one of us here is committed to that, and we must just perhaps set up committees, whether it's writing uh, popular articles for the media, not being shy about writing letters to the editor, uh, uh, <coughs> in every way possible, push those. Yeah. Um, I wrote two or three uh, articles for op end articles for the Cape Times, and they accepted them with alacrity. They obviously like something other than social misery type articles on that page now and then. That's encouraging. There's a question behind you. I just want to make a comment your generalization about apartheid giving the, uh, the, 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 what's the word, the, uh, you know, for the Sutherland Tours. I've been involved in Sutherland Tours since day one. And uh, in fact, going back before, it was just once a year, there was nothing. And, and our technicians were actually roped in to actually do the daytime tours because we were the only people away. Uh, your, uh, and, and later on, as the need arose, and as the, the interest rate was raised, uh, people uh, started wanting the, the, the night tours and that was, that was the once a year thing which went which into was open for, for a while and, and it, it was popularized but the main driving force behind this, nothing to do with apartheid, was actually salt. Mm -hmm. The publicity that salt gave mm -hmm. and if you plot that, unfortunately we don't have the numbers, but if you really would plot the number of visitors, mm -hmm. salt you would see a, a large kink there and, and uh, um, 
And your statement there about only middle class people getting SAO tours is actually, you, get, you must actually speak to our PR department because there's loads, bus loads of kids being, being driven to Sunday. So that is definitely not current information. That's very encouraging to know. And one can only hope that sponsorships for more bus loads of school children from the townships continues to increase. Uh, in a, a talk like this in the time, every single sentence I have should have, but on the one hand, qualifications and uh, a time and other things that you've just got to skip when you've got 20 minutes rather than, say, two hours. By the way, it couldn't have been Mrs. Copernicus because there wasn't one, but it might have been, been a very good friend. <laughs> I haven't known he was a, uh, what is the word, uh, a, a monkey in the water, a clock in the of it all. Day. So that would have been flirting, but we wouldn't have been allowed to be married. Thank you so much.